Hey, Riverland Comp 1. It is uh, Tuesday, September 15th, and I'm trying to get this uh, next lesson to you before uh, tomorrow. We'll see how I do. <laughs> Falling down a hill covered with paper. But I'm not going to let you guys down uh, down there. And I, <clears throat> I was just spinning a little bit of music there uh, as an experiment. Well, a couple of reasons, actually. I always, I'm trying to simulate a little bit what it's like in my classroom. If you enter, there's music and st stuff on the screen to look at. Something beautiful both in both ways and I uh, wanted to hear I want to see what that sounds like coming through this <clears throat> little lavalier mic I have I'm gonna keep the poem a little bit brief today it's a poem by uh, Gregory Orr who is an extraordinary lyric poet and I'll preview that uh, when I get there I also have I think three things in number we're back to that thing you know the magic number three I'd like to um, talk a little bit about rhetorical ethos, uh, which is just as old as the hills. And it's a really important thing to think about um, for, for many, many reasons. And I'm just going to you know, kind of graze its surface today just a little bit. Uh, today is the day where I want to keep building a, a model. I think I told you in the last lesson that generally I can take care of discussing arrangement with one class period and I can take care of uh, dealing with invention, which is the first house of rhetoric in one period. Today I'm going to hit a subject that uh, can't be uh, dealt with in just one day. It's a, it's a big deal uh, to me. Um, and, that, and that is style. And many English teachers don't want anything to do with it. It's, it's difficult to teach. It's, it's hard to learn about. And I, I have a way of uh, getting you thinking about it over the next couple days before we get back together on Friday. <coughs> And, and that is with the idea of um, clothing. Y young people are just naturally interested in, in style and the style something has. And we'll end with a story that just sort of, sort of, sort of opens that door, so to speak. And I hope this sounds like a, a class to you. Before I read you this poem, I want to tell you I had a fantastic conversation with John Olseth, English teacher at Riverland down there with you. I misspoke the other day. I said, you guys, you've got to take a class from my new best friend. Well, he's on sabbatical, so that's going to be kind of hard. And I believe he's on sabbatical for a whole year. But most of you are pretty young, so if you're going to be at Riverland a second or third year, I hope you don't pass up the opportunity uh, to, to, to work with John. And we are making plans to have a really epic project. Uh, and I'm getting very excited about it, even if it is a virtual reading. What's excited about it is that it's not going to entirely happen online. Uh, and our new uh, change, uh, change a game plan today is um, I'm going to cover the fee uh, of Joy Harjo, which is just a little shy of $10,000. It's a lot of money, so I better get grant writing again. And John is going to buy hundreds and hundreds of, of poetry books, hardcover. Um, I told you this already. I think we were at 600 last time, then it went to 700. Um, now we're north of 2,000 copies of Joy Harjo's new book, An American Sunrise. And we've got to figure out how to get, I don't, don't get upset, some of them, many of them are going to be going to area high schoolers, to Minnesota high schoolers, particularly if they attend a school where there's a lot of indigenous people, like the Nayashing School um, in, um, on Mil the south shore of Mille Lacs Lake, west shore actually. And I'm just getting um, really pumped about that. It's just amazing how quickly this guy and I became great friends. And why wouldn't that make sense? All you need, like we've talked about, you just need a little bit of love. And we, just, we love the same things. Uh, poetry and the promotion of literature. And we're both passionate about uh, teaching. So super pumped um, about that. And I, maybe I better stop repeating myself. The other day with that spot on that vertical line, right, heading into the future, I enlisted a paragraph from Gregory Orr's elegant book, uh, Poetry as Survival. Well, the guy's not only a beautiful prose stylist, he's a wonderful poet too. And I'm holding here a brand new book that I got um, this past summer with Faculty Development Funds, one of the 85 poetry books I got. Can't have enough. And it's called Orpheus and Eurydice, A Lyric Sequence. And maybe you know that story. Uh, I'm kind of a mythologist. I've been teaching classical mythology for 
10 years. And the story is, is one of the mo most important, I think, one of the famous ones in uh, Greek classical mythology. I forget exactly how she lands, lands up down there, but Eurydice, uh, the, the lover of Orpheus, ends up in Hades, in hell. And Orpheus is like, wow, I gotta go get her. I gotta go get her. I gotta go down there and get her. And he does. He descends into the earth, many stories down. And he goes to the darkness, but he, he doesn't bring his sword, even though the dude is a serious war, warrior. He brings instead a nine-stringed lyre, and he makes his appeal. And maybe you know this, Persephone says, okay, you can have her back, but there are conditions. You're going to walk up through that tunnel that you came down in, and she's going to walk behind you with Hermes. And the, the deal is... You cannot turn around and look at her. You must not turn around and look at her. And he's got to look, right? He gets all the way up to the right where the light is beginning, and he turns around, uh, and, and she's gone. Um, it's, a, it's a really sad story, and he loses her forever. So here's your, here's your poem for today. In my dream. In my dream, she was tired and lay down at the foot of the hill. I climbed on, eager to walk in the summit's wind-tossed grasses that blazed up in last light. But when I got there, the sun was gone, and the wind, so cold, it seemed to blow right through me. I turned to her and called, but she was asleep in the hill's shadow which she had become. Wow, that's a sad poem. Jeepers. Um, I don't know if you're taking notes or not, but the great thing about a vid is you can just, you know, pause it if you, if, if you, if you want. But I want to talk just briefly about uh, the beginning of the three uh, constituent appeals that swirl around this triangle that I've been talking about for years. It's as old as the hills. If you've ever taken a speech class, you've probably encountered it. And it's, it's, it's on the surface at first before you start really delving into it, it's pretty simple. Anytime any communication is happening between human beings, there is some kind of voice appealing to some kind of audience about some kind of subject. It's just how it works. It's in play when you text a friend. It's in play when you, when you take a class. Um, it's, uh, if you go have a cup, cup of coffee with someone that you're interested in, if you turn on a TV, which I don't recommend, I haven't had a TV in 30 years, it's always, always that simple. Someone is talking to someone about something. Now here's the thing. Uh, the ancients, so here's my crap cards again, although you're going to see a, a decent presentation on this pretty quickly. The ancients believed, Aristotle argues definitively in his rhetoric, that there is a persuasive appeal that centers on the voice, which could be a speaker or it could be a writer. And that's called ethos, okay? This is a big thing, you gotta remember this. Ethos, from which we get our English word, our modern word, ethics, is, is really about the character of the speaker. And for the ancients, for Aristotle, and for every, everyone between now and then, who's ever tried to teach or learn anything about rhetoric, ethos is comprised of three things. Goodness, goodwill, and knowledge of the subject matter. And by goodness, I, I don't mean you know, being adept or skilled at something. I'm, I mean morally good, morally a good person. And I don't, you know, I can't see you. Um, you can see me. And maybe eventually we can have some live Zoom meetings and maybe even a live Zoom class. I'd love that. Have one of those on the side. Get a little bit of interaction going. We should talk about that. I, I hope at least in the, in the last three and a half weeks, I'm trying to model it, right? I'm, I'm trying to be, it's a lot easier in a live classroom, obviously, but I work hard at trying to be a good person. I, I want to be a good person. I want to be virtuous. I'm trying to get to heaven or to stay out of hell where Eurydice is forever. I, I bear everyone goodwill. I try to love every student, every person I, I come across, even if it's hard to get along with them. And I, I hope you're picking up on the fact that I, I have some knowledge of this, of this subject matter. I've been studying and teaching English, English studies for years. 
Um, I'm not an expert on anything. I'm just kind of a generalist. I just love a lot of different things in English. And I, I know enough about, I know enough to be dangerous about most of its uh, subjects. And it, it, that's simple. And if, were we in a classroom right now, I would say, does anybody see anything about this that makes you nervous? Sometimes people hit it. Sometimes give, people give me the answer I'm looking for. And this is where, this is where the study of rhetoric can actually get a little, to be a little bit frightening. These three things, goodness, goodwill, and knowledge, they can be faked, okay? They can be faked. You can pretend to be a good person. You can be be pretend uh, to show someone goodwill. Hey, let's be friends. You can also pretend to know what you're talking about, and you might not. So the fact that these things can be faked is, uh, to me, a, nothing less than a straightforward, a frightening thing. It is a frightening thing um, that we have sophists in the world who uh, can feign that, who can uh, sort of impersonate someone who's trying to be a good rhetorician uh, like me. And I'd, I'd like you to do some thinking about this. And I've I got to get some journals out to, you, out, you to hear in a, out to you here in a moment. I feel like I'm stumbling a little bit today. You'll forgive it. Uh, and that is, that is the beginning. Ethos is the uh, constituent appeal that centers on the voice. It's about character. It's about human heart. Something the Greeks understood. They were all about that. Um, I want to show you some... Oh, well, i got to set it up first. You know, I realized when I was running this morning that I, I showed one of the presentations that I was most proud of making last year to my two comp ones and my classical mythology class in, in Brainerd at Central Lakes College. And I, this morning I was like, why did you not show that to your Riverland kids? Well, I can do it right now. It's easy. A little setup, though. I, I want to demonstrate for you, I told you, Rhetoric is the study of action. It is the study of the way we act on the world, and it is also the study of the way the world is acting on us. And I've got a lot to say about that, uh, as you'll see in the weeks ahead. But I, I don't think very many people realize how long we've been behaving symbolically. Uh, we've only, we, can't, we can only go take the real back so far. We can only go, you know, back seven or eight centuries before Christ, because we, we weren't writing anything down. Um, things were uh, simpler, but we've been talking to each other for tens of thousands of years and telling stories. And we've also been making art probably a lot longer than you think. Now, a year ago, I discovered, uh, last Christmas, I discovered something absolutely amazing. Until that moment, until I hit that National Public Radio article, I, I had this idea in my head that the oldest cave paintings on Earth uh, go back about 35,000 years. And I was, my jaw just dropped last Christmas sitting in my glass porch by my wood stove where I'm happy. And I was reading a, a story about new cave paintings that have been discovered in Indonesia that go back 48,000 years. They're absolutely gorgeous. They are unbelievable. And I'd like to show them to you. I got a little presentation that I made and I'm going to run it with a kind of a crappy projector that I run my faith formation program with for Immaculate Conception Church in St. Anna. It's got a little bit of wind noise, but I got a better projector coming and we'll use my whiteboard and try to do a better job with that today. But there's something about, and the first half of the, of the deal is all about uh, the paintings in France. And I'll tell you when it switches out and goes to the cave paintings that are in Indonesia. But something, something magical is in the middle of this for me. And I think I, I can talk about it in this way because no one's going to see this video up in Brainerd. At Central Lakes College, this is a, the setup for the thing that's in the middle, otherwise it won't make any sense. At Central Lakes College, I try to get to know everyone. I've spent 10 years trying to get to know everyone. I, the maintenance workers are important to me, and I, I, I know their names. Um, every, everyone, the guy, maybe I've said something like this before, the guy that cuts the grass and you know, sprinkle salt so I don't slip on a sidewalk on the way into the library where my office is. Those people are as important to me as the, the most powerful, brilliant professors there, all the way up to President Charlier, who's actually a microbiologist. And I, I get to know them. It's just part of the way my head is wired. And I've gotten to know very, pretty well, as, as, to the extent that one can, a woman named Jenny, who's a cashier for Prairie Bay and our cafeteria up there. And, 
you know, I have a habit. I get a chicken, a couple of chicken tacos every day when I have a chance to catch my breath, and I sit in my office and crank classical music and sort of relax. And as the, as the time has gone on, as the years have gone by, we, we've become friends. Now, this is a sad part, um, but you'll be okay with it. Um, I've been following the story of her grandson. She has a grandson named Gabriel. I followed the story from the moment that the boy was born. And the sad part of the sad part is that Gabriel's mother is an opiate addict. The opiate, the opioid uh, addiction crisis in this country is, is just horrific. And I know a little bit about it. I had a surgery this spring and I became an opioid addict in like 24 hours. I had to switch it out to massive amounts of ibuprofen and uh, Tylenol. I don't even know why I told you that. So I kind of, I kind of get it. And she's being destroyed by it. And Gabriel's father is, has no interest in this little boy. And weirdly, he lives with Jenny in the basement playing video games. So the thing is, I've, I've been following the story and then last fall, Gabriel started to be dropped off every day. He's four years old now. His dad started dropping him off about an hour, an hour and a half before Jenny's shift ended. And he, he came in the middle of the afternoon. And so here's what I did. I, I just started kind of befriending him a little bit. I'd find out when he was coming. It was usually about 1.30, quarter to 2. And the, oh, the corridor, the hallways at Central Lakes College, you, you can't eat. They're so long, you wouldn't even believe it. And it's good for me to do the walking. But all fall, when the time came, I'd get up. And I would uh, take the long, long hallway down to the cafeteria. And little Gabriel would be running around there. And... I'd bring him little toys, right? Nothing extravagant. I just always had a little something for him. And the visits were always short. But part of it is he's growing up in a world of women and there's not a lot of men in his life. And I just thought, you know, let me, let me be this for a while. Now, my wife told me to knock it off on the toys because she has this, all the toys. We have thousands of dollars, a lot of money, a lot of toys up in the attic. And they're for the grandkids, she says. Well, where are they? They haven't walked in the room yet. So all fall, I'd sneak up there and, and steal my own toys and, you know, slip Gabriel little, little, little things, little trucks and cars, and, and it always made him happy. And Gabriel is going to appear in the middle of this uh, presentation that I want to show you. And uh, he's so cute. And in this video, which is kind of crappy and handheld with my iPhone, you, you'll see that his cheeks are red because he's been outside. It's winter. And you'll see that when I ask him questions, every time I ask him a question, he always looks off to the right. That's where all the answers are for him. And I just, I've told you already, there's no singing of how much I love all children of all ages, but tiny children are the one, tiny children are just, um, that's where the world begins, man, with, with, with tiny, tiny little boys and little girls. And I, among the 10,000 things that I lost when the pandemic began was, my conversation with Gabriel. So let's have a look at this. So this uh, setup is not ideal. I'm just trying to, you know, put something before you that you can uh, that you can see and that you can look at. I'm just checking my levels here, and I think I'm doing all right on that. But okay, this is France, right? And I don't know what year this is. Probably I don't know mid 20th century when apparently they were a uh, discovering these caves. Now, I've never been to France, but if you ever go, um, this is what it looks like. I believe these are in the south of France, in Aix-en-Provence, a uh, place I'll probably never get to, but you can see that um, the cave paintings, some of them are huge. These are the ones, again, that are like 35,000 um, years old, and you can, you can go and um, study them, and I just, I, I, find, I find them beautiful. I could look at them all day long, and you know what? Sometimes I do. So we're still in France, and to repeat what I'm up to here, I'm just trying to get you realizing that we have been making art for a very long time. Um, there's lots of, as an arts provider in central Minnesota, I, there's all kinds of jokes available to me, like who wrote the grant to get this, and what did, it, what did starving artist mean 35,000 years ago? I bet you don't even think that's funny, but I do. Uh, teacher humor. And, I, you know, like take this, I don't think I could do this. They're obviously using, you know, indigenous materials. Um, I don't know what this is. 
um, you know, juice from berries, they're using charcoal. And these caves are way underground, by the way, which meant that they went in with um, torches. And I just think they're, they're really, really something uh, to look at. Now, this is the beginning of the 48,000-year-old uh, paintings very recently discovered in caves in the mountains of Indonesia on some island. And they get a little better than this. This is, this is uh, although this is fine. I don't know what, what is being depicted here, what they wanted to remember. I don't know what's going on with this guy here, but it could be a dance, could be a wedding. It could be, um, I don't know, maybe they're partying. I have no idea, but I, uh... My wife and I have a little disagreement about this one. We can't decide. Uh, I think that this is a, a dying animal, whatever this is, and that this is the daddy and this is the mama. Um, my wife thinks, well, maybe it's just resting. Maybe there's, it's about to give birth. I, I have no idea, but I feel a sadness from this um, uh, 48,000 year old painting. Okay, here comes my little dude. I hope you can hear All this. Right. I'm going to make a movie about something. Okay. And the something's you. How are you, first of all? Let me shake your hand. You doing good? Do you remember the last thing we talked about? It was last week. Puppets. Yes, good memory. Now, you, you told me that you didn't have puppets, but you had something on a stick. <clears throat> monster hands, like monster six. Well, well, we put our white eyes on one, but, but like, like, they, uh, like, like we had to put our hand on, on a paper to make monster sticks. Okay. But we put it how many eyes we could, so we made a baby one out of mine that could only do one eye. Okay. But, but that, those were just, just for Halloween. Halloween. So I packed them away. For next Halloween? Well, <clears throat> I have a Christmas present for you that I've been waiting to give you for a long time. In fact, and they're not real big, they're just little. But I have six of them for you. Okay? Here's the first one. Now that's called a fa Sorry that gets, got cut off a little bit there. I love that little boy so much. And hey, wasn't that a personification of wonder? One of the re requirements for this, for this class? We're still in Indonesia. This is 48,000 years ago. And uh, I'm thinking of Gabriel talking about his monster hands. We've all done this, right? You did it when you were a kid. You put your hand on a piece of construction paper that your teacher gave you and you'd, you'd outline it and turn it into a turkey or something. But here's the amazing thing. These are, I'm, I have the feeling that this cave painting is, was created with the hands of many villagers. Um, and, but I'm getting to the part that I just cannot believe. This is my favorite one and these are adult hands, but these are the hands of a child. These are the hands of a tiny child who came in and participated in the making of this art. These are the hands of little Gabriel. This is Gabriel, 48,000 uh, years ago. And that leads elsewhere. And I got one more thing to put before. So I'd like to at least, uh, like I said, and thanks for looking at that. It's, that's one of my favorite things that I made last year for students. I'm not big on PowerPoints. I use Keynote because it's Mac, but because um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Unless it's about images, unless we're looking at paintings and art and beautiful photographs. That's when I think that kind of presentation technology is, is being used appropriately. So let me end with a story today. and I'll, uh, uh, I'm not going to hurry either because I like this story too, although it's got a sadness to it. I guess I'm bringing up sad stuff today. I told you that, I keep repeating the idea, rhetoric has five, has five houses, invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. And it's an insufficient metaphor. It's not, it's not quite right, but it's, it's a starting point. It's a point of departure, a jumping off point. It was Cicero, who I've mentioned more than once in this class, who said that style is the dress of language. And I love studying style. And as inadequate as the metaphor is, it's a way to get going. So you can, you know, in, in a regular classroom, uh, when we're talking, I'm like, okay, let's have a conversation about clothing. 
and the relationship between what we wear and what that says about uh, wh whoever's wearing that clothing. And I can go back through the years. I mean, back in the 80s, when I started teaching kids, some kids had multicolored mohawks. I mean, I've just uh, and, and I experienced it as a kid, like just going, go, actually going through the decades, watching clothing style change, watching hairstyles change. This is a way, this is a way of getting going. Watching vehicles, uh, style of vehicles, style of houses, uh, hairstyles, if you have hair, quite unlike me. But I want to um, end with this idea that we can begin to think about style by just taking a look at what we have in our, in our closets. And what, we, what we wear to prepare our face to meet the faces that we meet, as T.S. Eliot would put it. There were a number of years at Central Lakes College where I would get this going in this way. And inevitably, um, my students up there would bring up a teacher named Thurman Knight, who's kind of a, a, a definite, but somewhat, to me, strange legend at CLC. He was a speech communication uh, teacher. And they would always bring up Thurman Knight. They'd always bring up Thurman. And I gotta tell you something, Thurman Knight had a little bit of a different look. He was, as we always decide, all decided, he was a walking Harley Davidson commercial, okay? Thurman was, he had long hair and he was pretty ripped and um, he, would, he would go down the hallway with a jean jacket with the sleeves cut off and his tattoos, you know, showing. And he had, he, there were, he was a serious educator. Um, he was particularly a, a guy who could connect to athletes, but I, he was also profane, okay? He swore a lot. And I got some things to say about profanity, and I'll probably save that till next time. I hope you, I hope you just try to avoid it. I, I do. But Thurman swore all the time. And I mean, like filthy, naughty, naughty words. He would swear at his students, swear to his students. And it was just this thing that he could not stop doing. The F-bomb was punctuation for him. And here's the thing. My students would always bring up Thurman, and they would compare Thurman to me. And their, their attitude was, Johnson, you're just, look at you. You're wearing a cardigan. Um, you're wearing a sport coat. You're nothing compared to Thurman Knight. They always would bring up how badass Thurman was compared to me. And one year I just had enough, man. I just said, okay, go out there and tell Thurman Knight I want to arm wrestle him right here in C223 on my home desk. Let's see who's badass. Go get him. But I was just being satirical. I was just messing around. And, it was, and I joked, and we get to the sad part. There was this afternoon, a couple days later, where I was trying to get to my classroom. I was trying to get to E339 through this beautiful courtyard where the birch trees and the pine trees are and all these beautiful hostas that Jeff Dirks planted. And Thurman called out to me. We weren't exactly friends. He basically swore at me for seven, eight years in a row. I'd say, hi, Thurman, and he was going, rah, 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 and he was just let me have it. And I'm like, wow. What is the matter with you? So we weren't, we, we were colleagues, but we weren't like buddies, uh, like I'm with other people up there. Thurman calls out to me, he says, hey, I hear you want to arm wrestle me. Why do you want to arm wrestle me? I got a little bit nervous and he was coming at me too. He charged right up to me and I said, look, I was just, I was just kidding, okay? I talk about style every year in my comp one and it ultimately leads to us con seriously considering and inter interrogating what we do with language when we try to be rhetorical. And they bring you up every year. And this year I just made up a joke about wanting to arm wrestle you. Because they just think you're so uh, rough and tumble and they think I'm a, kind, of a, a, kind of a wuss. And I didn't know how Thurman would take it, but tears welled up in his eyes. I'm like, well, what is happening? This guy's been swearing at me for years and now he's starting, oh. Okay. Now, you're going to say hi to my Riverland class because I'm making a video, okay? Say hi to them. Hi, Riverland. Remember when I told you I was making a video? Yes, but you said you'd be done now, I think. Okay, let me, I'm almost done, and then I'll call you, okay? Okay, fine. That's my wife. Tears welled up in Thurman's eyes, and he put his hand... God, we've got one problem after another here. Tears welled up in his eyes and he said, I, I think it's so great that you use me as an example 
time, in, in your lesson. Then he said, I'm so glad you're here. And he threw his arms around me and he hugged me. I'm like, what is happening? A Thurman Knight is hugging me. Two days later, that Sunday afternoon of that weekend, he died of a heart attack in his house in, in Brainerd. And I've been wondering, did he see that coming? Um, what, what, was, what was that moment all, of about, all about? I promise you, the next time we get back together, we're only, I'm only going to talk about super joyful, happy things. No sad stuff next time. So, be well down there, Riverland. I'll see you Friday.